All right, welcome everyone to Naturalist Night. My name is Jen and I am a librarian with the Santa Cruz Public Libraries. Naturalist Night is a program that we put on with the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And before we get started tonight, I just wanted to um, give you a couple of ground rules. Number one is please keep yourself muted. Um, there is an opportunity for interaction a little bit later on and we will let you know and you can go ahead and unmic yourself and interact at that point. Uh, but until then, during the presentation part, go ahead and keep yourself muted. This program is being recorded, so you can, uh, if you have to leave early, you can always catch it um, on our YouTube channel after the fact. Um, and if you don't want your face being recorded, then you do not have to turn on your camera. Uh, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and enter them into the chat box. Um, if you are unable to use the chat feature and you have a question, you can use the raise hand feature and we'll get around to you uh, when it's time to answer questions. If you need any tech assistance, uh, we don't have a library Zoom person, but I am the library person and you can go ahead and ask me. Um, this is a family event, so please try to keep your language appropriate. And if you have your video on, also keep your video appropriate. And the most important point is enjoy the presentation. Uh, we have Marisa Gomez from the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History and Justin Lung from UCSC, who are going to be talking to us this evening about coastal prairies. And with that said, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Marisa. Awesome, thank you, Jen. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for being with us. Uh, I'm gonna pull up my screen at this point to get us started. So my name is Marisa Gomez and I'm the public programs manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. So for those of you who are less familiar with us than others, this is the museum with our coastal prairie garden in front. Um, and our mission is connecting people with nature and science to inspire stewardship of the natural world. And I wanted to share just a few of our uh, core values with you before we get started, because I think they're relevant for today. Um, so we want to build community around stewardship for the environment, create a dynamic place for learning, dialogue, study, and exploration, celebrate the diversity of species, people, and cultures. And so I share those values with you because this series, Naturalist Night, is really meant to build community around our environment. And so we do hope that you feel comfortable chatting with us throughout the night. As Jen said, you can, you know, keep yourself muted, uh, you know, for most of it, but also I'll be asking questions throughout this. And so we're gonna try just like, you know, chime in. You can respond in the chat, but also um, feel free to unmute, turn your video on, get to chatting with us too. If it ends up being too unruly, I'll, I'll take it back. Um, but for now, let's give it a shot. Um, and just a little bit more about Naturalist Night. Every month we explore a different habitat that we have in Santa Cruz. And today we're looking at one of my very favorite Santa Cruz habitats, Coastal Prairie, or as we'll also refer to it, uh, Coastal Terrace Prairie. And we'll be joined um, by Justin, who's here with us uh, now, um, but also has a, a presentation for us um, later. So thanks for being with us, Justin. Um, for now though, I have a question for you. So this is the time where we will practice communicating with each other directly. Um, so what is in a name? Let's start by considering some terms here. My first question is for you to share with us what comes to mind when you see this word. And so let's just try, if you, if you wanna share a thought, unmute yourself, let's hear it. It's not a trick question. You can also write it in the chat too, if you'd rather. Justin, I saw that you were you were trying to chime in. Oh yeah, ocean. That's ocean, yeah. I see lovely. someone else in the chat along the coast near the water beaches. Great, thank you. Um, so that's our first word. Now terrace. Let's see if someone else wants to chime in with their voice for this one. Terrace. What comes to mind with the word terrace? Gardens. Gardens. Yeah, definitely. Julie shares staircase. Flat expanses from Vivian. Great. All right, finally, prairie. This word, What's what does prairie mean to you? Flat. I think open flat land. Um, yeah, I also think about like bison, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm just gonna share really quick uh, the definition for it. Land in a predominantly, uh, land in or predominantly in grass. Also, um, 
uh, generally uh, associated with like the Mississippi Rivi River Valley that in its natural uncultivated state usually has deep fertile soil, a cover of tall coarse grasses and few trees. And that is true, our coastal terrace prairies are grasslands. Um, but it's not true that they are in the Mississippi Valley. Um, and actually even here in California, there are many different types of grasslands. So we're gonna explore what defines coastal terrace prairie as opposed to foothill, valley, grasslands, et cetera. Um, so this image is one of our local prairies up at UC Santa Cruz that I took. And we'll get into where to find these babies in a bit. Um, but coastal terrace prairies are typically comprised of dense, tall grasslands dominated by native perennial grasses as opposed to annual grasses. So they live on for years. Also note that we're going to explore the many features of coastal prairies that are not grasses too, um, because there are many. It's naturally patchy and variable, so not uniform throughout the parameters of its zone. And this reflects differences in slope aspect, soil texture, and moisture availability. Um, it's restricted to cool areas within the fog zone which as we know today here in Santa Cruz, <laughs> we are in it. Um, coastal fog generally occurs within 20 kilometers of the coastline, uh, given that there is not a geographic barrier like a mountain in the way. Um, so cool areas near the coast in the fog zone. It's also uh, associated with the coastal scrub habitat. Um, so it closely matches up with that habitat type. Um, and it ranges from Santa Barbara to Oregon, but is pretty sparse uh, within that, that general range. So for those of us who are familiar with uh, the Santa Cruz area who are here, um, maybe we can think of places that come to mind of where you might uh, have seen a coastal prairie in Santa Cruz based off of those descriptions. Does anyone have a place that comes to mind? I can go back to it. Highway one, says David. Marshall Fields, yep. So yeah, Highway one is, uh, a, there's definitely uh, swaths of coastal prairie around there in the areas that aren't agriculture. Um, Marshall Fields or Marshall Meadows, which are part of the campus natural reserves for UC Santa Cruz, parts of Wilder Ranch, definitely. We've also got Arana Gulch, Poganip, Mima Meadow, which is also part of UC Santa Cruz. Um, Franklin Point area, which is um, not in Santa Cruz County, but it's on Nuevo um, up to Franklin Point around there is also a really great place to view. Um, this is just a, an aerial uh, view of Santa Cruz. So there's definitely more um, than just these places, but you can see, you know, grassland, you can kind of tell uh, where it is. Um, it's, it's not a lot. Um, and before we get into the biology of this habitat, we have to talk about the geology, of course, which is my favorite. Um, so we're going to chat about terraces, that word that we were exploring earlier. And we learned about this a little bit in our very first naturalist night class, um, but we're going to review it a little bit. Um, so the geology of the region, we got here the San Andreas Fault. Um, which is a sliding boundary between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. And for a long time, this was a subduction zone where the Pacific Plate was sliding underneath the North American Plate. But about 30 million years ago, this relationship changed and the fault formed um, when it started to move in what is called a right lateral strike slip uh, type of fault, um, which is really what has had an effect on our terraces. So as it moves, there's uplift. And little by little, over thousands and millions of years, the mountain range forms. And what we're also seeing here um, with the terraces is a sea level record. So just as sea level rises today, as the world's uh, glaciers melt, previous changes in the polar ice caps have raised and lowered the sea by hundreds of feet. And whenever the sea level remains steady for you know maybe a few thousand years, the pounding surf has the leisure to cut into the shoreline as the waves churn the sea cliffs into sand. They carved away the rocks as deep as they could reach and left a level surface behind. And then when you have uplift from tectonic activity, those waves cut, those wave cut platforms or terraces get pushed up. And there's also um, even more to it really of like sea level change within that is, is also um, an important factor for, for the terraces themselves. But generally that's what you got. So 
this is what they look like. These are the terraces. Um, and our coastal terrace prairies in Santa Cruz exist on the various levels of these terraces. And the higher up you go, um, the older they are and the more erosion that has occurred. So the less pristine the geologic terrace is, it also can be drier up there. So the climate, topography, soil, all of these are factors in why coastal prairies are what they are. Um, and what are they really? Uh, so I wanna talk about what you're likely to find in a coastal prairie in Santa Cruz. I apologize, these pictures are blurry. <laughs> um, but in addition to what we've discussed uh, as the markers of a coastal prairie, according to a study from 1996 by Stromberg et al., um, they're also defined as those areas where stipa pulchra or purple needle grass and uh, Danthonia californica or California oak grass are the dominant native grasses. So that's another um, important uh, aspect of what makes a coastal prairie is like what plants actually are found there. Um, and both of those grasses that we just saw, both the purple needle grass and the California oak grass are bunch grasses or tussock grasses. Um, and they're awesome. They're really cool. Uh, they have these long roots, as you can see here in this exhibit from the Oakland Museum, which can aid slope stabilization, erosion control, and water absorption in the soil. Also, their roots can reach moisture more deeply than other grasses and annual plants during seasonal or climatic droughts. So it's an important feature of coastal prairies. Um, but there's also way more to our coastal prairies than just grasses, even though there are many more grasses you could talk about too. Um, but I do wanna focus on the forbs for a moment. And I'm wondering if anyone knows what this, this word means. Can anyone describe what a forb is? There's another word that comes to mind when I think about these, these plants that isn't forb. The word that comes to mind for me really is whenever I find a new forb, I'm finding a new wildflower. Um, and forbs are herbaceous flowering plants um, that are specifically not a grass, a sedge, or a rush. Um, so that's a, that's a word for you to add to your list. Um, and in addition to the grasses, the forbs are a really important part of the coastal prairies that make them so diverse. A square meter of undisturbed native coastal terrace prairie may be home to over 20 native plant species and may have over 100 species in a hectare. They're incredibly biodiverse. And that's not even including the many animals you may find. In some areas of Santa Cruz County, coastal prairie habitats support as many as 250 species of native wildflowers. And the California Native Plant Society lists 13 species of concern for our county and their inventory of rare and endangered plants in California. Um, I'm also curious if any of you who are at all like already familiar with um, coastal prairies, if you know of any of like these important plants that we find there or special plants or have um, like a few favorites that you go out on the hunt for. I know that I do, um, but if you, if anyone wants to share one, please have at it. I'm gonna, um, be going through uh, some pictures that I've taken over the years in some of our local coastal prairies and just share a few of those plants. I see in the chat, um, someone likes the buttercups, of course, uh, mariposa lilies, <clears throat> definitely. That's my favorite. Coyote thistle, vetch, vetch, yeah. Um, so let's go through a couple. We'll go through some. These are these are the pictures that I was easily able to find from like my iNaturalist observations or on my phone. But there's just so much to look at when you go to a coastal prairie. Most of these um, pictures were taken at Mima Meadow. Um, also, I think maybe some at uh, Swanton Pacific Ranch. Um, but yeah, I'll just share a few. So on the left, we've got Fremont's Death Camas, Toxicoscordian Fremontii. Um, on the right, California Golden Violet, Viola Pedunculata. We've got on the left, witch's teeth, which is Hosakia gracii and a lupin on the right. And I am always hesitant to identify lupins because I, I feel like I have such a hard time with them. I think it's a um, very colored lupin. Please let me know uh, in the chat <laughs> if, you, if you have a different opinion or if you believe that is correct. 
Um, also, uh, there's the Dense Flower Indian Paintbrush, which is Castilia Densiflora Densiflora. And its cousin, the Purple Owl's Clover, which is Castilia um, Exerta, which is uh, definitely a rare and special plant that we have in these habitats. Wavy leafed soap plant is maybe, you know, a little bit more common. Um, Chlorogallum uh, pomeridianum, sorry, I'm so terrible at pronouncing Latin. Um, but this one is one of my favorite plants. It's got this um, very useful bulb uh, that it grows from in the ground and the bulb has saponin in it. It can be used um, and has been historically used to um, stun fish. It, it uh, lowers the surface tension in the water and makes it so that fish have a harder time breathing. And so it's um, been a, a common fish trap tool. Um, you can also make like a paste out of it. It's very fibrous, so you can make brushes out of it. And it's got these lovely flowers, which are um, kind of like a local night blooming um, flower. They open up uh, as, um, as it turns to night. So I love the wavy leafed soap plant. Um, golden uh, Burdea and yellow Mariposa lily. There's the Mariposa lily. Uh, love it. We've got a couple different uh, species of Calicordis that you can find in, uh, in our coastal prairies and gotta be on the hunt for the Calicordis lilies. Love them. Um, and the diversity of these prairie wildflower species in turn supports an even greater diversity of insect species, many of which are severely reduced in numbers, um, such as the genus uh, Skinia, which are colorful diurnal moths. Um, there's some solitary bees. Some uh, of the species too actually just teeter on the verge of extinction, like the Ohlone tiger beetle, which you can find um, at Mima Meadow. So why are these species endangered? The you know 13 rare and endangered species listed by the California Native Plant Society, these insects, what's going on? Um, I'd love it if someone can share some theories about, uh, about what's happening within the coastal prairies that's impacting these species. Land usage. Land usage. So like um, it's no longer coastal prairie, like development has occurred. Yeah. Yeah. Habitat loss, loss of habitat, human encroachment, um, definitely climate change. Yeah. So maybe um, with climate change, like maybe the, uh, um, the conditions are just changing. So it's no longer um, those conducive conditions that we mentioned before. Um, development is definitely a huge part um, of it. Destabilization of ecosystems, um, definitely. So there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons. Um, some main ones that I wanted to point out are invasive species. So species that come in and out compete the natives. Um, urbanization and development. So land is just, you know, gobbled up for another purpose. Um, and lack of disturbance is a big um, factor too that we are going to be exploring. So first I wanna talk about development. And according to the California Native Plant Society, nearly the entire first coastal terrace in the Santa Cruz area was probably prairie, you know, around 100,000 years ago, but very few areas of this terrace remain with an intact native prairie. Um, much of the Pajaro Valley in Watsonville and up the entire north coast of Santa Cruz has been developed into agriculture um, and then also housing. The second terrace in the city of Santa Cruz has been developed with the exception of areas of Poganip and La Viega Park. Further north, large areas have been lost to row crop agriculture. Um, and with row crop agriculture and just agriculture in general, if you're um, planting something something different, you're replacing the plants that are there and it tills the soil and it has a, um, a lasting impact on the seed bank, um, different than maybe grazing kind of agriculture. Um, and much of uh, the city of Scotts Valley was also once prairie and has been um, basically is not at all anymore um, because of development. So that's a huge, a huge factor in why we don't um, have as much coastal prairie as we used to, which definitely impacts the species. Um, another issue is habitat type conversion. This is a huge one. Um, so even if there is still the coastal prairie there, no one's built on it, it can still um, become not coastal prairie. So in addition to native or invasive plants like 
rip gut brome out competing the native grasses and shouting out shadowing out the low forbs you also have native habitat encroachment um, so not that we till up the soil with agriculture or slap a building on it but we allow other habitat types to take over even native ones um, <clears throat> so we're going to look back at an area north of us tilden park um, i think it's like east bay and see the impacts of fire suppression that began in uh, the 1800s and this was all um, put together by some folks at Berkeley. We're gonna share the resource for you, but you can see that this is a picture from this um, park in the 1880s. And you can notice that it's op basically open grassland. There's some oak trees, but not many. Um, by 1951, you can see that there is some scrub land that is coming in to this grassland. By 1971, it is far more, um, covered in scrub. And by the 1990s, there's hardly any grassland left at all. And this was um, uh, an aerial view of it from 2014. Basically, it's completely scrubland now. And you can see uh, here, it's, it's completely converted. And this is what happens when this habitat is left alone in present day Santa Cruz. Um, and this isn't always what you have, what would have happened without human involvement though. So this is the current situation. If you leave coastal prairie alone, this is basically what happens, but it wasn't always the case because there also weren't always people here, but coastal prairie have been here for a long time. Um, so part of it is that for many thousands of years, Pleistocene megafauna grazed this landscape and animals like mastodons, giant sloths, camels, like wild stuff, these animals would graze our coastal prairies and by doing so would keep out encroachment of scrub and coniferous forests. And uh, okay, so then they went away thousands of years ago, but we still had coastal prairies, right? Um, so what happened? Does anyone want to posit what came next? Deer, so maybe like other types of grazers ice age. Um, so these were um, around for the ice age. Uh, Megan, yeah, native people managed with fire and other, other tools. So we're going to spend a little bit of time now talking about indigenous culture of the region. The first people of the region came, um, came next and have been here for over 10,000 years. The indigenous people of present day Santa Cruz County include the Awaswa speaking people of the Kiroste, Chitoni, Sayanta, Aptos, and Uipi tribes, among others. And these tribes helped the landscape and actively managed their resources. Coastal prairies provide a lot of resources, food in the form of seeds, animals, insects, also important materials for baskets and other tools so it was important to maintain these prairies for the people who lived here. And early settlers who arrived to California mistakenly believed that they encountered an untouched wilderness that was naturally so productive and beautiful that they described it as a wild Eden. But as ethnoecologist Kat Anderson explains in her book, Tending the Wild, the productive and diverse landscapes of California were in part the outcome of sophisticated and complex harvesting and management practices implemented by the indigenous people who had lived on these lands for thousands of years. Tribes like the Kiroste near present-day Año Nuevo tended to the landscape with tools like fire, which I want to focus on now. Indigenous fire is different from the wildfires we think of today. They are low-intensity fires conducted in the late fall through early spring because Indigenous people burned regularly at least once every 10 years and often every one to three years. There was not a lot of fuel accumulation which is not something we can say for our fires today. Um, these were slow moving fires that would burn up dried thatch, but not kill the native grasses. They would stimulate the germination of annual forbs and grasses, but not burn so hot as to kill the seed bank, which is not always the case again with our more high intensity fires that we see all too often in recent years. But with <clears throat> colonialism, these practices were put to a halt. For most of the last 200 plus years in California, government agencies have considered fire the enemy, a dangerous destructive element to suppress and exclude from the land. Traditional ecological knowledge and landscape stewardship were sidelined in favor of wholesale firefighting and a kind of land management that looked like natural conservation but left the ground choked with vegetation ready to burn. 
colonial attitudes and racial prejudice contributed to the prevailing opinion that Native Americans did not systematically manage their environment in a deliberate fashion, which is false. The Spanish viewed indigenous set fires as quite destructive, and this burning was put to an end when, on May 31st, 1793, the Spanish governor issued a decree to the missions detailing punishment for Indians convicted of starting fires. This order, combined with the forced relocation of the native population to the missions and the subsequent population decline, as well as continued fire suppression during the American period, which is evident by the order seen here from 1850, effectively marked the end of the Native American fire regime on the Central Coast for a very long time. That being said, there are still indigenous stewards today who are working to reintroduce these practices. Um, here is an image from the Amamutsin tribal band and their land trust who steward our region on the ancestral lands of the people taken to missions Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista. They work with other partners such as Cal Fire to implement their traditional ways of relating with the environment, including regular low intensity fires as they were doing here in this picture at the San Vicente Redwoods. They have been um, able to do pile burns, I believe at Curoste Valley Cultural Preserve, which is managed by state parks up by Año Nuevo. Um, but they have not yet been able to uh, apply large slow burns to that area, I don't believe. Um, instead, they're working on manually removing species like Douglas fir, coyote brush, hemlock, all things that you can see encroaching into the valley here. Um, and this is a picture that I took on a museum program with the tribe a few years ago. So it's probably 2018. And you can see that it's, um, it's a grassland, but there's a lot of encroachment coming in. All of this is encroachment that, fo that followed decades of, um, of a lack of disturbance. And actually this area before it got handed over to state parks was grazed. So that's why there was still coastal prairie here is because for a really long time, it was privately owned um, and grazed. <clears throat> and so again, when fire is removed or large grazers are removed, you allow encroachment from um, these other habitat types and your coastal prairie becomes scrubland or coniferous forest or oak woodland. Um, at Wilder Ranch, the native oak woodland, for instance, is encroaching upon the prairie there. If you go up to Marshall Field um, or Marshall Meadows at the north part of campus on Empire Grade, um, you're seeing Douglas fir and coyote brush come in. Um, so our few coastal prairies that are still intact in Santa Cruz County are technically protected habitat types. So conceivably development should happen, but apparently it doesn't always work out that way. Um, and even so, these prairies are not necessarily being managed always in a way that will keep type conversion at bay. Um, burns have happened at Wilder, Big Basin, Henry Cowell, San Vicente, these controlled burns, um, not to mention that uh, pretty much all of those places I just listed were also impacted by the CZU lightning complex. Um, but there are plenty of prairies that aren't being burned regularly or haven't had prescribed burns come in yet. Um, other substitutes for burning are grazing and mowing. So lots of our prairie habitat is actually privately owned and a lot of that is being maintained by grazing like at uh, Swanton Pacific Ranch, which is run by Cal Poly. That's up the coast um, between Wilder and uh, Davenport. Um, and they don't burn there, they do grazing there. I say they don't burn there, but again, they also were impacted by the CZU lightning complex. So it'll be interesting to see um, how, that, how that impacts their property. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the coastal prairies of our area. I wanted to um, open it up if anyone had anything they wanted to share, any questions before um, I bring in Justin to share a little bit more with us. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share? Okay, well, we're really lucky to have with us today um, another uh, presenter to help fill in this understanding of this local habitat type. And um, Justin is at UC Santa Cruz in the Environmental Studies um, Department, and he's a partner uh, with us through the, the Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History. And I'm really excited to have you, Justin, to help share um, your research to help fill in uh, this, this understanding of what's impacting coastal prairies, but also like what's um, what we can do about it. So take it away, Justin, I'll stop sharing. Oh, thank you. 
Um, and thank you all for joining today. So today I'm gonna to be talking a little bit more about coastal prairie restoration and um, also the impacts of climate change on coastal prairies and restoration in general. Feel free to stop me anytime if you have any questions throughout the interview, I mean, sorry, throughout the presentation. Um, and I'll have a few minutes at the end for questions if anyone has any. So we know climate change is happening in California, but are we really sure what's gonna happen with all of these different elements in the, I guess, with weather and climate? So for the most part, um, well, I guess maybe we can make it a little more interactive. But so um, does anyone have any idea what's gonna to happen to temperature in the future? Maybe. So this would be a good time to respond in the chat or verbally. Well, it's gonna get hotter. Yes, great. So it is definitely gonna get hotter. Um, let's see, sorry. Um, but great. So now what's gonna happen with precipitation or rainfall? Probably less rainfall. Yes, potentially. Yeah, so it is predicted that we might have less precipitation or rainfall, but it's really kind of unclear what's gonna be happening with rainfall in the future. It's actually predicted that we might actually have um, more variability in our rain events. So these graphs here kind of show um, some, the frequency of extreme uh, climatic events that are gonna be happening in Southern and Northern California. And on the left-hand side, we can see um, the likelihood of extremely wet events. And on the right-hand side, you can see extremely dry events or droughts. Um, and we can see for the most part, um, there's a little bit of a difference with Northern and Southern California for drought, but overall, it tends to seem like we're gonna have more extreme climatic weather conditions in the future, which means in certain periods, rainfall might be lower, but in other times it might be higher. And overall, the average may stay similar, but we are gonna have a lot of differences in how rainfall is distributed throughout the season um, and how long it's distributed for, most likely. And then there's another, really um, interesting question that we have to really wonder about with coastal prairies. And we touched on it briefly before, and this uh, coastal fog. And that's kind of one of the elements that make coastal prairies really uh, special and unique. It's because they have this coastal fog in the summer that helps provide alleviation for water stress um, in those really hot periods um, where some of these plants may not actually be able to persist in um, the valleys where it's hotter and there's no coastal fog. A good example of this is California poppy, which often stays perennial uh, along the coast, um, but becomes annual in the Central Valley because it's so dry. And we also know that these changes in climate, um, both in elevated temperatures and in the distribution of rainfall throughout the season is likely gonna affect species distribution and also potentially thresholds of where species, species can live and survive. So in order to address some of these questions, one of the approaches I've taken is to look at certain particular plant traits to see whether or not there are particular traits on plants, like their leaf area or their lobeness or the amount of um, their water use efficiency, um, and basically see whether or not there's any relationship between these plants, where they occur, and whether or not certain plants um, with particular traits are more likely to survive in the future um, using these large um, simulated rainout shelters that you see in the background here. So these rainout shelters exclude 60% of rainfall, uh, simulating a one in 100 year drought after five years. That way we can kind of test some of these questions about extreme weather. Um, and um, also interestingly, these uh, structures are located uh, 70, at least 72 places across the world on every continent, including Antarctica. Um, and so that allows us to kind of get a greater kind of global perspective on what's happening with biodiversity and global production as well. And so one important thing we found so far is, yeah, uh, certain leaf traits are really important in determining what plants are uh, successful in certain areas and in certain coastal prairies. Um, so for example, plants that have highly, um, that are clonal for a while, clonal often tend to do better. So common yarrow is a plant many people might know or alkali or creeping wild rye, um, those both spread um, rhizominously, which means they spread underground and re-sprout above ground. And those plants tend to do really well 
um, especially in the context of drought. They do well in general. Um, and then um, in other instances, plants also tend to do better when they have higher leaf lobeness, um, which might be like a strange thing to think about, but it's basically, if you think about the edges of a leaf, how, uh, how dissected or I guess cut it is compared to how smooth the margin is. Um, and oftentimes the more uh, lobed and less smooth the leaf margin is, the more likely the plant is be able to withstand drought um, because they can adapt their the plant temperature um, to match um, quickly changing temperatures. And then one other question that we also are interested in restoration, especially grassland restoration, is what happens after we restore these plants? A lot of times, um, some of you may have heard before, grassland restoration and restoration in general is really fund limited. And so we often don't really have enough money to do everything we want to do. And in the degree of specificity or um, even um, quality sometimes that we want. And that's just because there's such limited funding. So a lot of times we might think of restoration in kind of like a well-funded place like Younger Lagoon Reserve at UC Santa Cruz or some of the state or federal uh, parks where they have um, money um, almost all year round to support restoration and other conservation activities. But in a lot of other places, um, like a lot of nonprofits, they just have localized grant money that only allows them to go out and plant plants or seed throw out seeds once and maybe weed their restoration site once. And then they also don't really provide any money to go back and see what's happened to the restoration site after it's been restored. So a lot of times we actually really don't even know what's happening with restoration, um, which causes a, a huge gap in our knowledge of how to successfully and effectively restore um, systems, but grasslands in specific um, for the future. And then as mentioned earlier, climate change makes it more complicated because it makes everything a moving target. And so another, so another issue that can affect plant success is plant, success, uh, plant selection. And so here we have a couple of forbs that we just learned about on the left-hand side, which are wildflowers. So we have our poppy and we have um, a royal lupin there. And then on the right-hand side, we have California oak grass on the top and uh, purple needle grass on the bottom hand side. And you can actually see, maybe you didn't, never noticed before, but grasses actually have grasses, to, uh, grasses actually have flowers too, which are these little kind of purple things and white things coming out of the grasses. Um, and so one big issue in restoration right now also is once we find that a certain plant does well, for example, I previously mentioned that we know clonal species often do, do really well in restoration um, within, uh, I guess, predicting for climate change or even just generally speaking in current time. And so oftentimes people choose plants that do really well, like those um, rhizominous or vegetatively, sorry, vegetative spreading species, um, and kind of use those plants in all the restoration projects because they often also have compliance goals they have to meet. And because of that, we often tend to have the same plants restored across the landscape. And it tends to decrease overall diversity at the landscape level. And so that's one other issue that we're kind of trying to think actively about in restoration and, and work on. And so to address some of these issues, I am also surveying restoration sites from Santa Barbara to Humboldt um, that range from three to 30 years in age. I know that doesn't sound really old, but restoration actually did just kind of started around the mid eighties. So uh, 30 is kind of like the, almost the upper range of the, the age of a restoration project you could kind of get. Um, yeah, so those are kind of some things that I'm working on in Coastal Prairies and um, other people are working on as well. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. And yeah, that's all I have for today. Thank you, Justin. Um, that's really interesting what you're sharing about um, the plant selection and that because certain plants do better with uh, with planting that it means that you just kind of like do the same one over and over again and we were just you know talking about how biodiverse this area is and so maybe it's not really being restored to to its fullest um, that's interesting yeah, like definitely been... and that that's a huge issue in um, grassland restoration or coastal prairie restoration in particular. Um, and it's actually called, we call it a perennialization, 
because these species often tend to be perennial and they're more robust. And so we often tend to actually lose the wildflowers, which are kind of one of the most, not, I wouldn't say it's the most important component, but it's definitely one of the components that people want to see the most. Um, so, and it is really important for pollinators as well. Um, so that, but just to be clear, grasses are really important too, but yeah. a lot of people don't necessarily realize that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so this kind of issue leads to a really grass heavy landscape with very few um, wildflowers to speak. Yeah. I've been curious, like, I mean, so again, going back to calicordis, love the calicordis lilies, and it's, they're not something that you see in nurseries ever. It's not like you can go buy like a, a globe lily or a yellow mariposa lily. Um, so how, do you have any experience with seeds of, of flowers um, and forbs? Yeah, and, so, and like, yeah, they so, just don't... Um, annual species are really difficult, which is another kind of issue in restoration. Um, so a lot of times that's also another reason why we kind of see more perennial species in a restored site compared to a, a remnant site. Um, seeds are really expensive to get. A lot of times reserves have um, really specific local genetics, uh, local genetic specifications, um, which is a whole other issue that we didn't get into today, um, that basically restrict where they can get seeds from so they can't really buy them commercially. And so it almost makes it impossible for them to incorporate those species unless they have a lot of money or staff collect those seeds themselves. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely sounds like such a challenge. There's so many things to have to, to have to think about. Um, yeah, I have other questions, but I also I also yes. see that there's some questions in the chat. Someone um, is asking, can you tell us areas that are having restoration? Um, they imagine the GGNRA does a lot. Yeah, so the GGNRA is the Golden Gate National Recreational Area. And yes, they are doing a lot, Diane. Um, they have some of the best, sorry, uh, well, I don't know if I could say the best, but they definitely, in my opinion, have some of the most spectacular um, restored coastal prairies that I've seen. They have really amazing plant diversity. They have wildflowers, they have their um, bunch grasses. Um, and they have been working, those are some of my oldest sites, actually. They have been working on a lot of those sites since the mid 90s. Um, and they have really great funding for it. Um, so they are able to go out and plant every year um, or almost every year and seed it um, whenever they have some extra money, but definitely have enough money for people to go out and manage the non-native species that come in, um, that kind of encroach into habitat and that often um, are really present in uh, store sites that are initially restored because there's a lot of disturbance. Um, and having that kind of workforce is really important in kind of helping the plants establish because they often get outcompeted. And they also have a huge rest like volunteer team, which is really useful. Um, if you're interested in local restoration, there is restoration at Younger Lagoon Reserve down by um, Natural Bridges. It's on that same road and you can park there and walk basically um, down towards the gate and that's Younger Lagoon Reserve and there's some restoration over there. Um, there's actually also, if you're around Capitola area, there is the Fairway Coastal Terrace or Fairway, sorry, Fairway Terrace Coastal Prairie Preserve, um, which is uh, owned or run by the um, Santa Cruz Land Trust. And they, they, don't have, they don't have nearly as much diversity, of course, as the GGNRA, but they do have some great um, oak grass stands and some wildflowers there too. And Danthonia, oak grass actually, um, people are finding it's pretty hard to restore. So that's um, another good place to find it. And if you're ever looking for flowers in particular, Marshall Field is an amazing place to go, um, even though, it and that hasn't been restored, but that's a really great place. Yeah, definitely. I um, also just share that it's not a restoration site, but we have a demonstration garden in front of the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History that is um, it was helped uh, developed by Groundswell Coastal Ecology, and they do a lot of restoration sites um, around primarily like around like beach areas. So if you see the native plants at Natural Bridges at Seabright Beach, areas like that, um, that's their um, work oftentimes in the cliffs and in like the dunes. Um, but they also helped us with our, our demonstration garden, which is not a restoration site. It was replacing sod that went in there. <laughs> um, but if you are curious about some of these plants, we have um, a good variety that's on display. Um, so I recommend visiting. Yeah, and then maybe one other place I, um, I would recommend is, uh, oh God, what was it? 
Oh, uh, it's called Russian Ridge. It's in San Mateo County and it's run by the Mid Peninsula Open Space District. It was restored sometime about 10 to 15 years ago. Um, but, uh, and it's in San Mateo, I, I think I said that, but it's a really amazing view and a really great restoration site with pretty great amount of diversity. It's a little kind of on the edge of the coastal prairie um, of where the fog influences it, but it's definitely another restoration site um, to check out if um, anyone is interested in restoration sites. Um, and I see the question about pollinators as well. So in terms of like special, so there's a lot of pollinators. And um, so some of the really kind of key pollinators that we find that might be that coastal prairies might be important for are native bumblebees. So um, in some of my previous work and, and other work that people, other researchers have done in California, um, we have, most of us have found that um, native bumblebees tend to take refuge or just tend to be more present in remnant and restored coastal grasslands compared to non-restored areas. Um, so, and, and that's kind of important also because native bumblebees are actually on the decline. So that could be one potential way to help, um, I guess, with conservation effort, efforts for bumblebees. Of course, a lot more work needs to be done to kind of understand those dynamics. But um, initially, that's kind of what people are finding. There are a lot of other pollinators in coastal prairies as well. And I'm not sure, I'll, I'm not an insect specialist, so I can't say I can't say for sure if there are any that live specifically in coastal prairies. I know the Ohlone tiger beetle, which is not necessarily a, it's not a pollinator, um, but that only lives in coastal prairies. Uh, well, yeah, it only lives in coastal prairies, plus um, the sand hills, I think. Um, yeah, there was, I, I'm not sure if it's in our resource list that we're sharing out or not, um, but I, I did find a list of um, prairie dependent um, wildlife uh, insects specifically. And so I'll, I'll double check that too. And um, I know that question's from Megan, so I can maybe just like um, share that with you, Megan. Sure. And I mean, I guess so referring to the last one, the common rhyme I usually hear are grasses are, or rushes are round, sedges have ed edges, and grasses are jointed down to the ground. Um, because most of the time, if you run your hand down a rush, it will be round for the most part. There's exceptions to every rule. Um, uh, like flathead sedge, sedge is flat. <laughs> um, and then sedges have edges or generally are triangular. And, gra and grasses, generally, when you feel them down, they often have like these little uh, joints where the leaves come out of or they bend. And so that's kind of um, the rhyme I've always heard for grasses. Yeah, a little bit more family friendly. <laughs> um, I'm also curious, Justin, if you could share a little bit about, so um, your work at Younger is about precipitation and like thinking about drought and, and thinking about that. I'm curious though too about like the, um, the aspects of how to manage and maintain these landscapes as an aspect of restoration. Um, we were talking earlier about fire and grazing and I'm just curious if you have anything to share about like the use of fire versus grazing versus mowing versus like actually pulling weeds. Um, um, yeah, there is a lot of different pros and cons. Um, so one big issue um, with, so restoration, like, a, like we previously mentioned, is really um, costly and often requires a lot of labor um, for it to turn out um, well, so we think anyways. Um, I'm actually finding that projects that don't necessarily have as much labor often kind of turn out somewhat similar. Um, actually kind of hopeful. But uh, so generally speaking, if you can hand weed, that's really useful because you can do really targeted work. Um, and so that's really great if you're planting new species or you're seeding plants. Um, fire is really important for a lot of species. And that's one reason why we're not seeing a lot of uh, wildflowers and, or forbs, so to speak, um, because a lot of Forbs actually have wildfire uh, cute germination cues um, and may require a certain temperature for the coating around their seed to break um, and for their seed to take in water afterwards. Or sometimes they actually um, react with the chemical in um, smoke. So you could actually use liquid smoke or sorry, yeah, liquid smoke to um, simulate that too. Um, and so fire can be really important also, and it also helps clear up like non-native vegetation where native vegetation can often handle it unless there's a lot of built up brush 
um, which is another actual issue in uh, coastal prairies, is um, brush encroachment uh, from coyote brush and also from Douglas fir. And that people mostly think that coastal like grasslands need to be planted with trees um, to make them more productive. But actually, coastal prairies have way higher diversity than the forest. Not that we don't need forests too, but um, we all definitely need prairies as well. Um, I'm not really sure if that answered the question because now it sounds like I'm really going. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, it sounds just it's complicated. I did read something about um, like actually like pulling weeds can sometimes be damaging we're within coastal prairie, like um, like upsetting the soil in that way. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, that was the question. Yeah, so uh, the other issue with hand weeding is it can often cause more soil disturbance and non-native species or invasive species often love soil disturbance. And so that can sometimes causes like endless, or not necessarily endless, but a really long feedback cycle where you're weeding and then more weeds come in until you kind of exhaust the and surrounding seed rain. Um, which is really hard to do without a lot of money. Uh, so yeah, yeah. yeah. also use grazing. And so that's also really useful. You can't do it as targeted kind of weeding, um, but it works well in established areas like Mima Meadows. Mm -hmm. It's also really important for certain species. Um, so for example, the Loney tiger beetle requires open habitat space. So on top of having grassland, it's really useful to have grazers go out and um, eat and basically trample the grass and pull up some grass in certain places and that kind of helps facilitate that builds the habitat for the loney tiger beetle which is an endangered species on campus um and and around the county um yeah and then there are other ways that people manage so their grasslands as well um mowing is another really common technique um and this is kind of like oftentimes mowing is used because you can't get um you can't get grazing because it kind of does similar things to gra as grazing without creating the open space which we sometimes want um the benefit of grazing the grazing the sorry the benefit of mowing though is um we can target when it's done so a lot of times non-native grasses non-native annual grasses um, flower or um start to see a couple weeks before the perennial grasses and you can actually mow everything at that time and the perennial grasses will come right back that season and then they will flower right after that and for the most part the non-native grasses will be done um yeah. they might still produce a little bit of seed but not nearly as much as um yeah before. that's brilliant that that sounds perfect <laughs> yeah just the thing yeah i love you that know, another I really fun that. technique which i forgot is also um called solarization or black plastic or tarping and we basically take black plastic and we lay it out on the um, ground and put sandbags on all the all ends of it. And it works better in the summer. And basically you heat up the ground and basically kill all the plants under it. And that works really well in areas that are basically completely um, in over and that you wanna like do some, what we call grow kill cycles before you plant your native species in. Yeah, so interesting, so many different ways. Um, I guess one other thing that I just wanted to chat with you about really quick is um, the fires uh, the, from the CZU Lightning Complex. And um, if you have like any insider knowledge about Coastal Prairie um, that has burned from that or like what what efforts are, are going on right now to, to study that impact. Yeah, so there definitely have been Coastal Prairies burned by the the recent fire complex. So there were definitely areas at Swan Ranch Reserve that were burned and that had coastal prairies. I imagine that the folks over at Cal Poly um, who uh, own Swan Ranch will likely be doing some work on that. Um, I also believe parts of, well, many parts of coastal prairies along Highway 1 burned. Um, some of that's public land, some of that's private land. So. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not 100% sure what will be happening with that. And then there's also some random patches that burned along the kind of mountain grade that coastal prairies can sometimes occur within, um, kind of along Empire Grade, I mean, down towards Bonnie Dune. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of what might happen to the grasslands, it's a little unclear right now, mostly because there hasn't been much work done on coastal prairie recovery from fire in the past. Mm -hmm. but, Broadly speaking, 
we might be able to, it may be a good wildflower season um, if we get good rains because of the higher germination cues. Um, but we also, um, depending on how hot the fire is burned in some of these places, if, um, if there's been a lot of shrub encroachment, it could have actually also tilled off underground um, root roots reserves or um, bunch roots. Um, and that could also detrimentally affect the prairies as well. Um, yeah. yeah. We find, yeah. find oftentimes with an increased fuel load from other shrubs, the ground gets hot enough to um, eliminate non-native seeds, but also potentially impact native plants as well. Yeah, so it'll be a balance. I guess I'll just mention that um, the museum in partnership with the Norris Center, um, and we've been talking with Justin about this, um, we are uh, working with a couple other partners and trying to talk to some uh, land managers about setting up a community science project to monitor the impacts of the fire um, on you know a variety of habitats. So, um, so we're working on that right now, but in the meantime, we encourage you to take pictures always of the nature around you always, um, put it up on iNaturalist, let's document the natural world around us, but also if you do have access to some um, burned areas, we're very interested in seeing how, what comes back first, um, you know, and how, how these, um, uh, these organisms are reacting to, to what has happened. And um, your work now, taking pictures now, can be applied later for when we have um, a platform uh, that's, that's built. Um, so uh, yeah, and uh, for the iNaturalist project, there's currently um, a parameter set up that's for the CZU lightning complex that was set up by um, actually some, some people involved in iNaturalist um, who did it. And so we're gonna use the same parameter. So it'll, um, your observations within that um, project zone will automatically be added to that project. Um, so just, yeah, start adding them. And also your pictures from pre-fire are also useful because we can see you know, what, what it was like before this occurred. Um, so if you've got some ones that, that have been hanging out in your, in your phone album that you haven't yet put up onto iNaturalist, please do. And let us know if you have any questions about iNaturalist, happy to, um, to help get you started with that. Um, and also just speaking of photography, I'll do one other plug if that's okay. Um, the museum has a, an exhibit that we're gonna be launching in the new year that's called 2020 Vision. And we are going to be looking back on the year 2020 through the lens of the natural phenomena of Santa Cruz County. So this is open to Santa Cruz County residents. Um, and any pictures that you've taken in Santa Cruz County that, that are of nature, really, that show, um, show off natural phenomena around us, um, you can submit them. It's super easy. And um, we're going to have some physical examples in a physical show when that's possible, and also a virtual exhibit. So um, please do uh, share your pictures with us that way as well. Um, and I think at this point, let Jen come back in. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Jen. Hey. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to um, thank everyone for coming and thank our amazing speakers for uh, sharing their knowledge with us. I do want to add that part of the library's responsibility for this program is creating a resource list. So I do have a resource list. Um, it is comprised of books, DVDs, um, web resources, and databases that I am going to send out as a PDF for everyone. So check your email for that and in just a moment. And then uh, we also ask that you do our follow-up survey. So I will add the follow-up survey to the email that I send out, but if you miss it, it's also going to be in the automatic follow-up survey that is generated um, automatically um, once because you've signed up for this program. So if you don't see one, hopefully you see the other. Um, and this is our penultimate naturalist night. It, next month, uh, we are going to be talking about possibly wetlands or possibly uh, sand hills. Right, I Marisa? just can't decide. Yeah. <laughs> some, some great habitat of Santa Cruz we'll be discovering. Yeah. They're both very exciting in their own ways. Um, but we very much look forward to that. And I just wanted to thank you both again. Uh, I think that was fantastic. And thank you everyone for coming. And we hope to see you next month. Thank you all. Thanks everyone.